Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Michael Grouske, and I am one of the Ath Fellows this year. Throughout history, there have been countless failed scientific proposals. In some cases, scientific failure is the result of experimental error. For example, widely publicized reports in 2012 that scientists at CERN had discovered a particle that could travel faster than light were later retracted after it was determined that the results were caused by a loose cable. In other cases, failure is the result of flawed reasoning or processes. For example, the early 20th century view that Mars was covered in canals built by an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization. Regardless of the underlying reason, scientific failure is an important phenomenon that can certainly pave the way towards new discoveries and refinements in the scientific process. Here to discuss scientific failure with us this evening is Lee Jessup, a social psychologist and the former chair of psychology at Rutgers University. Over the course of his career, Dr. Jessam has focused on a number of issues, including the ways in which scientific processes lead to erroneous conclusions and identifying processes that rapidly correct such errors, leading to more valid conclusions. In addition to his research, Dr. Jessam led the best practices in science group at Stanford University's Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences from 2013 to 2015 and he is the co-founder of the Heterodox Academy, which strives to increase viewpoint diversity in academia. His book, Social Perception and Social Reality, Why Accuracy Dominates Self-Fulfilling Prophecy and Bias, received the American Publishers Association Award for Best Book in Psychology of 2012. As always, audio and visual recording is prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Lee Jessam to the Athenaeum. Can you hear me? Do I, I, mean, I can yell. I, here, come on. Do, do I need to yell? I'm good. I'm good. That's coming in? Okay, good. Just get the logistics down here. All right, well, first, just thank you for having me. It's really an honor and a pleasure um, to be here. Um, especially in a forum that obviously by its name alone harks back to the Amazing accomp uh, accomplishments of the, the intellectual accomplishments of the early Greek civilization. So, but I have a question. I'm going to start off actually with a question for only the undergraduates here. So, who here knows uh, how Socrates died? Yeah. Okay. This. So the there's the hemlock story, right? That's the story, right? But why did he have to drink hemlock? You know that. Okay, he was convicted essentially of blasphemy. So there is a long, deep intellectual tradition of blasphemy, and I hope to do my small part to follow in that tradition. Oh. Okay. So I am going to be talking a lot about science going bad and kind of towards the end on about what to do about that. And, you know, you might wonder about, you know, what this is all about. Is this some sort of, you know, I don't know, assault on science? So let me start by talking a little bit just about my own views on this stuff. I, I see myself as a scientist. Uh, I want science to thrive. I want more people trained in the sciences. I want more money devoted to science. I'm not anti-science. I would say I'm probably about as pro-science as you can get. Um, as Michael told you, I'm co-founder of the Best Practices in Science group at Stanford and Heterodox Academy, all of which are about improving these things. And you might ask or wonder, why do these organizations exist? Like, why do we need a Best Practices in Science group? And my answer is, my reason, is that I and a growing number of scientists are concerned that science is suffering from this sort of complex set of illnesses that is throwing it off track. Which gets me to the question of whether science is going off the rails. Now, to even raise the possibility that science may be going off the rails may seem on its face to be a really weird question given that we've been to the moon, and we're surrounded by all sorts of amazing technology. I don't know if you can see that graph, but 
you know, life expectancy has been going steadily up and up over the last you know, 200 years, um, all of which is true, although I would point out that probably three of those things are more about technology than basic science, and even life expectancy is as much an increased understanding as about things like cleanliness than it is about medical science per se. But regardless of that, um, you can certainly tell great stories about the historical successes of science, which would be true. I mean, science basically lifted uh, Western civilization out of the Dark Ages. Um, but those stories and bona fide successes, I think, tell you very little about how science is functioning here and now. And as a scientist, to me, how science is functioning here and now is actually an empirical question. How well is science working? We should answer this with evidence from the present, not with history or ideology or opinion. So what I'm now going to do is run through some fairly quickly uh, sort of a body of evidence suggesting that all is not well in the house of science. And let's start with my home discipline of psychology. Uh, so psychology is going off the rails. That's pretty clear. Um, and I'm going to give a very sort of brief and superficial introduction to this. But statisticians and methodologists have been ringing alarms about problems in psychological science and psychological research for over 50 years. And really what has happened is that the individuals ringing these alarms have been held in like awe and, and sort of, you know, respect. Oh, these people are amazing and they're successful and their name shares and then their recommendations were consistently ignored. That, this, that's pretty literally true for really over 50 years. And that began to change about five years ago. Psychology suffered a series of shocks to some of its foundational beliefs. Uh, there were a series, not, a, not one or two, a series of revelations that some influential, successful psychological scientists had engaged in blatant, naked fraud. They had made up data. They were eventually driven out of the field, but this was a shock. This was shock number one. I'm not going to go into any detail on this, but at about the same time, there was a very influential study, a study that, found, that, that formed the foundation of subfields within psychology. And when someone tried to replicate the study, reproduce the study, it completely failed. At about the same time, John Haidt, an eminent social psychologist, stood in front at a major social psychology uh, professional conference, kind of like this, only with like a thousand social psychological scientists in the audience, got up, he's way more diplomatic than I am, so in his like nice, congenial way, basically accused the entire field of political biases that essentially discriminate against non-liberal non faculty, and more important, dysfunctionally distort the scientific conclusions of the field. Now, you may not be surprised to hear that this led to all sorts of food fights, right? So the uh, Ivy League name chair, whose work was not replicated, kind of went ballistic, and people were insulting each other, and da 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 And you can imagine that a bunch of liberal social psychologists were not happy about being accused of political bias. So there were this series of essentially food fights er erupted. At about the same time, the, am I blocking this? This is good. The most prestigious, influential journal in my subfield, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, published a study claiming to demonstrate, purporting to demonstrate the reality of ESP. Which led many of the most sort of um, expert methodologists and statisticians to go ballistic. 
I'd like to say probably most of us think ESP is ridiculous. So hypothetically, you know, in science, like anything could be possible. But if I had to put a probability on the estimate of ESP being true, my personal estimate would be about this is the probability. So 1% would be 1. My estimate would be 0.00000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
You know, not all to be, right? Either dubious, and by, by dubious I mean, well, it's not that we know it's false, but the evidence indicating it's true is way more equivocal than first thought. Bogus, like, you know, there's a publication saying it's true, but it's not. Uh, misrepresented, so maybe there's something there, but the way it's talked about is, and written about is un largely unjustified, or at least exaggerated. It's just tiny effects extolled as powerful. So uh, I'm not going to go into any of these in any detail. The important point is that there are 17 here, and there are only 17 here because I want to move on to my next slide. I could have filled three slides with this. I'll just leave that up for a minute. I'll take a sip of my coffee. Some of you may know some of these. Some of these are kind of intuitively reasonable. Some are maybe not so much. So I'm, I'm going to move on. It just goes, it doesn't really matter. Right? This is like a completely, again, there could have I treat this so much like this now. That, so I used to teach introductory social psychology. This is like a sophomore level class, sort of a broad survey class of the field of social psychology. I haven't done that in about 10 years. I have to admit, if I was to teach it now, I don't know what I would teach. That's literally true. I mean, I have to teach something. I'd have to come up with an answer. But if I had to start tomorrow, I don't know what I would do to figure it out. OK, so sometimes. This is referred to as psychology's replication crisis because there's been, over the last three or four years, there have been numerous attempts to replicate social, psychological studies um, and a disturbing number have failed, which is why it's called a replication crisis. That title is a great title because some of the reaction to this really seems like defensive turf protecting to some people. So uh, actually, the author of this article, uh, this was in The Atlantic, so this is pretty easily available. This is not a scientific journal. But The Atlantic gets this stuff right most of the time. Interviewed uh, one of the authors of a paper claiming that, no, replication rates are much higher than, um, than often claimed, a and asked the author of that paper, um, well, do you think you're being defensive about your sort of status and prestige in the field might be something influencing your claims that the field is better off than it seems. And he hung up on her. So that's, I think, where the title comes from. Um, and this one is even better. Psychology is in crisis over whether it's in crisis. This is absolutely true. This is exquisitely true because Estimates of the replication rate of the, the, the ability to replicate studies in social psychology and psychology range, you know, some people will, will claim and have claimed in print, in scholarly journals, that it's as low as 25 or 30 percent. So, you know, one out of four, one out of three studies replicate, two out of three, three out of four cannot be replicated. And others will claim that, no, it actually is somewhere between 80 and 100 percent. Almost everything's replicable. So what does that tell you? That tells you there is no consensus in my field as to what constitutes a failed or successful replication. We have no consensus on it. And it gets worse than that because even if the two sides would agree that this study failed to replicate this study, they would still not agree on what that means. So I, again, I, I could spend 20 minutes on that, but I'm going to spend two. So for example, one thing it might mean is that the original study is bogus. right? It failed to replicate the original study. But another thing it might mean is that the replicator is incompetent. Or that the, repl that the replicator is an evil person out to purposely undermine the original. So all of these are in this sort of discussion, these kind of claims about what replications may or may not mean. So not only do, do we not have consensus on what counts as a successful or failed replication, we don't, we have, there's no consensus on what a successful or failed replication even means if we were to agree on it. So yeah, we are absolutely in crisis over whether we're in crisis. Okay. So, because of stuff like this, psychology's only Nobel Prize recipient, Daniel Kahneman, kind of stepped in, sort of early in the crisis. This is 2012. 
basically urging psychologists to get their act together, to figure out what was wrong, uh, to really cut the food fights out, that when people had differing views of these things, they could engage in adversarial collaborations. So if I do a study that fails to replicate your study, really what we should do is get together, figure out how to do it right, and attempt to replicate it. That would be an adversarial collaboration. And you know, this was a good sort of constructive attempt to improve the field. But you can't make this up. Uh, Kahneman himself has this best-selling book that uh, came out five or six years ago. Um, that was a review, not merely of his personal research, and his research revealed a slew of ways in which judgment and decision making is plagued by all sorts of errors and biases, but it was drew on literature across psychology to understand sort of intuitive versus analytical type thinking. The book, like I said, was a bestseller. It got rave New York Times review, New York review, reviews in the New York Times. You can see it right here. Profound, full of intellectual surprises, blah, 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 blah. OK. So interestingly, over the last few years, some of the research that uh, formed the basis of some of the chapters in this book were exactly some of the problematic research that I just presented here, some of the failed replications. And so uh, Yuli Shimak, who is a science reformer at the University of Toronto, uh, subjected the empirical studies in 11 of uh, Kahneman's chapters to one of these new forensic, there's a whole uh, suite of, well, I think of them as forensic analyses designed to figure out the validity of prior research. He calls his the replication index, which, which Casually speaking, he refers to as a doping test for science. So just like uh, athletic performance can be artificially uh, enhanced through the use of steroids, this is the artificial enhancement of the validity of scientific results through the use of questionable techniques. And what he found was that in five of the 11 chapters, the work was of low quality and unlikely to replicate. Now, just to be clear, this was not Kahneman's empirical research. His, Kahneman's research has been subjected to these tests and it always comes through flying colors. So the point is not that Kahneman was a bad researcher. It's not even that Kahneman had bad judgment. Kahneman's book was based on what counted, or our understanding of what counted for good research at the time. And the failure of the research in five of the 11 chapters isn't a, and evidence that Kahneman is sort of, I don't know, flawed in some way. It's a testament to the problematic nature of what constituted normal business in psychology at the time. Yeah. Actually, it was, it was Slate. Yeah. Slate dubbed this the irony effect, how the scientist who founded the science of mistakes ended up mistaken. Okay. So to me, even though you'll often see this um, referred to as a rep uh, replication or replicability crisis, we, and we do have a replication crisis, a replicability crisis, it's way beyond replication. The, this set of events Re really has raised questions about almost everything that we do, in s about the validity of almost everything that we do, which is why I think this really captures it. Psychology has more than, a, it has a credibility crisis. It has a validity crisis. Okay. Uh, put differently, we are uh, thigh deep in figuring out what the hell is wrong and right with our field. So you might be wondering, OK, so that was sort of my sort of overview of psychology. Well, you know, it's a psychology. Psychology is not really a science. Anyway, what about other disciplines? Uh, OK, this is neuroscience, uh, the relationship between uh, brain scans, sort of brain activity, and all sorts of other things, behavior, judgment, decision-making, and the like. Voodoo correlations. What, a, what is a voodoo correlation? It is a finding of 
what they described in the paper as an impossibly high correlation. So I'm not going to explain how they know whether it's impossible or not, but trust me, it's not really that hard to do. Um, and what they find is this evidence over and over again in neuroscience studies of uh, non-credibly high correlations. Now, uh, it, one of the commentaries on this paper pointed out that voodoo correlations are not just in neuroscience, they're pretty much everywhere. Okay, so let's move on to political science. Uh, this was a study that, this is a New York Times report of a study that ultimately was retracted, claiming that it was incredibly easy to flip people from being, uh, you know, from opposing gay marriage to supporting it. And it turned out that the guy made up the data. Sticking with political science, you might be surprised to discover that political pro polls are, uh, seem to be wrong really far more often than they should be, and that actually seems to be getting worse rather than getting better. Uh, papers in economics, not reproducible. Uh, the first line is great. At least half of the papers in economics are not reproducible. A new analysis is found. And uh, before departing the social, social behavioral sciences, let's spend a minute on what I see as the pervasive problem of political biases in the social sciences. So this is probably a fairly hard sell here. I mean, this is you know, urban, coastal, Southern California, academic, right? I mean, chances are nearly all of you are left of center in your personal politics, and I'm going to be arguing for liberal biases as a pervasive problem throughout the social sciences. So let's just talk about the skew. There's been a slew of surveys that have come out over the last few years. They do things slightly different in different surveys. Some compare Democrats to Republicans. Some you know, people identify as Democrat Republicans. They identify as liberal or conservative. Um, some focus have focused just on psychology. Others have focused across the disciplines. Those, the range of people left to right is somewhere around 10 to 1, 7 to 1, 8 to 1, 10 to 1. Sort of depends on how, it done, how it's done. But my favorite is actually a very recent survey. It's not yet uh, published. It should be coming out this year in my home discipline of social psychology, where rather than asking about their identity, people often resist being, identifying with these uh, groups, they ask people who they voted for in the 2012 election. And <laughs> 301 voted for Obama, and four voted for Romney. Okay, so now, I'm not making an argument for either of these things being right. You know, this is personal opinion, this is politics. My only point here is that you have this gigantic skew across the disciplines. Okay, well, so you have a skew. Well, so what? We're objective scientists, aren't we? Okay, so there have also been surveys asking people point blank about their willingness to discriminate against other faculty based on their political beliefs. Now, I'm gonna, it, it turns out that conservative faculty are just as willing to discriminate against liberal faculty as liberal faculty are against conservative faculty, but there's just there are so few conservative faculty that their willingness to discriminate hardly matters, so I'm gonna focus exclusively on uh, left-wing willingness to discriminate. So, again, depending on how it's measured, you have between 30 and almost 80% of faculty endorsing, saying yes, Yes, we should not hire a conservative. Okay? And even worse, endorsing not uh, uh, supporting grants, talks, and papers if they believe those grants, talks, and papers adva advance a conservative uh, uh, perspective. So, what is this going to do? This is going to skew the disciplines away from certain kinds of conclusions independent of the degree of validity of the evidence for those conclusions. Okay, so as part of this effort, over the last year, um, my group um, uh, invited, via one of the professional listservs in social psychology, um, students and faculty to share with us their personal experiences of political bias, if any. And I'm not going to go into that in any great detail, but 
we have this collection, this fairly long collection of stories, and all I'm going to present here are the titles of those stories, which will give you at least a feel for what people are telling us. Grad student called fucking Republican by a professor. Faculty told that voting for the British Conservatives is equivalent to voting for Nazis. And I'm not going to so read it. You can read each of these yourselves. But it really is quite kind of an appall, in my opinion, is a kind of appalling list of experiences by mostly junior faculty and students. So that paper is going to be part of an edited book on the politics of social psychology. Um, it actually has 14 different entries. I'm only going to pr present a handful here. And again, from the titles alone, you can get the spirit of the topic and the problem. So do ideologically driven scientific agendas impede the understanding and acceptance of evolutionary psychology? Does I political ideology hinder insights on gender and labor markets? How politics undermines measurement. Political values infiltrate the assessment of scientific research and advocacy and the application of psychological research. Now, it is perhaps worth reminding you that this is in my field of social psychology, where I, one of the chapters, one of the other chapters in this book is the one that has the results were 301 to 4. I mean, so the the book has thir a total of 32 authors. So your numeracy needs to kick in. Even if we have all the Romney voters in my field, <laughs> that means 20, <laughs> which I'm sure we don't, but even if we did, that means 28 of these 32 people are left of center in their personal politics. When people left of center are raising f red flags of warning about the potential for left-wing biases to distort the research, even people on the left might want to consider listening. OK. It's not restricted to psychology. Both of these are titles of papers uh, that recently, in the last few years, appeared in sociology journals. And the first one, society, the second is American sociology, the politicized science, ideology has hindered sociological insight. Um, this actually recently appeared. This was an editorial in Nature. Like now, Nature is this big, right? It, it's like you have science and nature, right? These are big, big science journals, and what they are calling for is essentially an end to the sort of political distortion in the, not just the social sciences, but also the sciences. So you, know, you can see the subtitle there. It's crucial to fight discrimination in all its forms. Academia does itself a disservice by excluding conservatives. And then in here is this following quote, confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is the tendency for people to readily accept, in this case, scientific research or conclusions that comport well with their personal beliefs, including but not restricted to their political beliefs. But if it opposes your belief, then all sorts of analytical process give, oh, well, well, we shouldn't necessarily believe that. How do we know? Is it, is it a representative? How are the statistics? Blah, 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 blah. OK, so confirmation bias is rife in all walks of life, including the practice of research and the political viewpoints of academic literature. Liberals. So, you know, to me, this is actually kind of satisfying to see that this, you know, those of us who've been making this argument have been making it for years, and it has for a very long time, felt like it was having basically no traction because it's a very hard sell, right? How do you convince, you know, liberals who are attracted to science because it's objective and valid and, you know, they kind of want to be immune to all this stuff that, no, you're really not immune, and despite what may be your best efforts, you're kind of failing? Like, who wants to hear that? But that this has ro risen up to the level of, ac of nature, I think, is actually you know, kind of a, a, a good accomplishment. OK. But you might say, OK, well, so I'm just talking about social and behavioral. Surely this, these kind of issues, uh, you know, the issues of fraud and rep difficulties replicating and the whole sort of 
a panoply of problems. This is social behavioral. Those aren't real sciences anyway. Let's you just talk to me about the real sciences. Okay, so let's talk about the real sciences. Amgen is a pharmaceutical company uh, that attempted to replicate 53 landmark studies um, about pre-cancer interventions, interventions designed to prevent or reduce cancer. Findings published in the most prestigious journals, journals like Science and Nature and Cell. 47 could not be replicated. Bayer, you know, Bayer Aspirin, big pharmaceutical company, had essentially the same experience where they performed 67 projects based on the academic literature. 53 could not be replicated. Because of issues like this, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of John Ioannidis. He sort of has created the field of meta-science, which is the scientific study of scientific processes. Um, and uh, has been exposing these kinds of problematic practices for a very, very long time. You know, the first sentence of this article, again, which is also in the Atlantic, which does a great job with this stuff, much of what medical researchers conclude in their studies is misleading, exaggerated, or flat out wrong. Sound familiar? And he has this amazing sort of unholy trilogy of academic uh, papers why most published research findings are false, why science is not necessarily self-correcting, and why most discovered true associations are inflated. Now, these articles can be subject to criticisms and limitations themselves, but the, my only point is that somebody as eminent as Ioannidis is publishing these kind of articles in prestigious peer-reviewed journals, again, should at least be raising concerns about how well biomed, he's focusing mainly on biomed, so certainly about how the biomedical sciences are functioning. And it's not hard to find stuff like this. These are both from the New York Times. This knee surgery article, this is an amazing article. It's a great read. That's one of the things I require in my undergraduate class. So uh, people had cartilage damage in their knees, and they were randomly assigned to either get arthroscopic surgery or sham surgery, so they would be brought in, they would put under anesthesia, they'd have holes poked in their knee, but there'd be no surgery performed. Months later, there was no difference between the people who got the surgery and the people who did not get the surgery. And then there's this follow-up article, kind of on why useless surgeries are still disturbingly popular. Okay, so that's biomed, what about chemistry? call to arms on data integrity, and then this one, fraud and trouble with replication are chemistry's problems too. And then there's this. And the subtitle is really just, you know, it's like amazing. Maintaining scientific integrity in a climate of perverse incentives and hyper competition, but that's actually not the best thing about this article. My favorite thing about the article is the highlighted section on the bottom, which even though it's there, I know it's like I'm talking, I really shouldn't read it directly, but this is like too, this is like too amazing, I have to read this. If a critical mass of scientists become untrustworthy, a tipping point is possible in which the scientific enterprise itself becomes inherently corrupt and public trust is lost, risking a new dark age with devastating consequences to humanity. Okay, so maybe that's a little histrionic even by my standards, but first, this is an engineering journal. Second, even if this is over the top, and I'm not really sure that it is, but, but even if it is over the top, again, simply the fact that scientists can write this and get it published in a peer-reviewed journal and not have the reviewers and editors freak out that, no, this is so over the top. This, this, I mean, at least several reviewers and an editor did not think this was insane. While we're on the topic of engineering, in my wanderings along these lines, we had a chance to interview some engineers about practices and problems um, in their field. And we asked them, um, these two engineers that we were interviewing, 
um, what they thought about the credibility of the science in their engineering journals. Because we asked them, you know, um, what do you believe from your field? And the answer was, we don't believe the findings of any other lab. So then we asked them, do you believe the findings from your lab? This is a direct quote. <laughs> OK. So I think there, is, there are pervasive reasons to believe that there are problems across the sciences. Which raises the question, why? Why are, why are all these dysfunctions uh, appearing? Why do they occur? Can you see that in the back? Yeah, I know this is kind of small. Well, this was one of the first that this was actually by a science blogger. Goes through the nine circles of scientific health, each of which are a form of scientific malpractice that get worse and worse as you go descend into the circles of health. So there's overselling, you know, kind of making, claiming that you've found something stronger or more important than you actually found. Post hoc storytelling. So I, I really I, I need a blackboard. What post hoc storytelling is, is you draw a, uh, like a target with a bullseye, and then you plant the arrow in the bullseye. And you say, look, I hit the bullseye. P-value fishing, this is sort of the statistical funny business I alerted to it, uh, earlier. So you know, kind of massaging the data till you kind of find something that you can run with. Creative use of outliers. So outliers are like you might have some set of data that kind of makes sense. And then a couple of response, a couple of people or animals or results are just way off and not on land. And so if you use those creatively, you can make the data tell a story that you want it to tell. Plagiarism. Uh, the seventh and eighth are non-publication and partial publication of data. So if I run five studies and three say what I want them to say and two don't, well, we can just bury the two that don't. If, I can, if I'm running a single study and I run a zillion analyses and half a zillion say something coherent and the others not so much, I don't have to tell you about the other half zillion. And then obviously there's fraud. But that's a good start, but it's really woefully incomplete. Um, I, the, the literature on this stuff reveals all sorts of other dysfunctions, including traditions involving using sort of inappropriate statistics, st statistics that don't do what people think they do. Um, there's using statistics that are appropriate, but then misinterpreting them. Obviously, there's uh, bad printing. In, certainly in the behavioral sciences, often in the biomed sciences, also use the use of sample sizes that are so small, there's almost nothing that can be uh, believed from it. Uh, use of unrepresentative samples, which is not inherently a problem, except if you start generalizing to all of humanity. Um, you have honest error. Listen, we all make mistakes. I've made mistakes. Um, but if those mistakes get published and not corrected, they kind of get reified in the literature. Um, there is also this reification of statistical significance in peer review, as if if something is significant and it's published in a peer review journal, now it's an indelible fact never to be challenged. What the hell? Okay. Um, this is, this is a manifestation of, of confirmation bias, but in the research process. So if uh, I'm a professor, you're a student, say, or a graduate student, you do some study, it comes out the way we want it to come out, great, write it up, let's publish. But if you come to me and say, boy, you know, the hypotheses were not confirmed. In fact, everything looks like it's in the wrong direction. It's completely opposite. I'm going to say, well, bring me the data. Let's look at the data. Let's make sure everything is done correctly. Let's double check this. Let's double check that. And so what you get often is much more careful attention to undesired or unexpected results. And because the expected stuff is not subject to the same kind of scrutiny, you get weaker stuff slipping through. And then, of course, there's the political problems of political stuff driving conclusions. OK, so where do all these bad practices come? So there's all these bad practices. Where the hell do they come from? Well, if you think about it, scientists are people. So they, we, certainly include myself in this, have lots of goals other than finding out things that are actually true. Mm, they don't necessarily prevent finding things that are actually true, but they are at least more or less independent of finding things that are actually true. Like, we want to get published. We want to be famous. We want grants. We want to get, you know, we want to be high paid. 
get promoted. In some cases, we want to create startup companies. We want to be you know, uh, beloved and respected by our peers. We have political agendas that we want to advance. Again, this is part of the human condition, I think, but none of these are directly linked to findings that are inherently true. But then there are also system level practices, things that are not really characteristics of the science, scientists themselves, that reward scientists for things other than finding things that are actually true. So there are systems that value productivity. So any, any academics, it's public, publish or perish, right? And universities have gotten more and more sort of intense about counting, counting publications and citations and, it, you know, and I impact metrics and all this kind of stuff, which is fine, but the extent to which any of that is hinged to the findings actually being true is actually deeply unclear. And then there are systems that value not just amount of sort of productivity, but specific kinds of findings. So journals tend to prefer, prefer sort of innovative and unexpected results. So if you, if you find what everybody else is finding, it's not interesting. Why should we publish our article? So there is going to be this bias towards the sort of unexpected findings. Until very recently, journals have been, at least in, in, in many fields, disinclined to publish replica replications because, again, there's only, there's only two possibilities, right? You could replicate it, that's not interesting because we knew that already. If you fail to replicate it, well, then you're going to create a firestorm, right? So, you, I mean, tr traditionally what would happen if, if I published a failed replication of your study, the editor would send my failed replication to you and you would have ten, and confirmation bias would kick in, and you would have 10 million reasons to, to explain why my study sucked and my study probably would never see the light of day. So who wants to step into that morass? Um, journals tend not to like messy results, so especially in the social and behavioral sciences. You know, people are messy. There's, you know, re results about people are usually, you know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. You know, it, it's very unusual to actually have something that's really, vi where the result is so clean and consistent across a set of studies. Uh, Journals are clearly biased towards statistically significant findings. They're uninclined to um, uh, publish null results. And obviously, journals are more favorable to certain types of findings, especially if they favor uh, particular political agendas. And some of that's the nature of the beast. But to the extent that um, uh, journals prefer certain, that, that the rewards, the incentives, are to find certain kinds of findings, well, scientists are going to respond to incentives and produce more of those findings. In fact, you know, researchers have strategies to achieve these goals, to, to get, gain these um, incentives. We want to publish a lot. We want to publish these sort of amazing, world-changing findings, or at least we want to claim our findings are amazing and world-changing, whether they are or not, whether you know, we're sort of not reporting the failed studies or not. We want to tell that story. We want to, uh, it's certainly easier to publish if your results, if they're, polit they're a politicized topic, they're politically pleasing to one's colleagues. We tend to want to defend our prior claims. We want to get the stuff out. We want to get media attention, especially over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, you know, Doing TED Talks, getting New York Times coverage is a way to enhance scientific prestige and success. Okay, so there's all this mess out there. What do we do? Well, the truth is no one really knows what, what's going to solve this. These are proposed solutions. These are solutions that are out there in the scientific literature about what to do. So I'm not going to go into any of these in any de details, especially since this is mostly an undergraduate audience, because each of these would require you know, probably 10, 15 minutes in, in and of themselves. But each one of these are changes to policies or practices in scientific fields. And the idea is that if we adopt one or more of these practices, the underlying quality of the science eventually will improve. And the technical solutions is ultimately where the rubber hits the road. But I'm not going to dwell on this because I am going to shift back into my psychologist mode and end mostly on the psychology of scientific integrity. What do you need to do? What are the 
psychological resources you can and should draw on um, in any field, whether you're a scientist or not, in order to live your life, I would argue, um, with high integrity, especially, which is especially difficult given all these other things pulling you in other directions. And so, come on, you can do this. Oh, that's right. I am going to, given all the problems in science at the moment, we're going to turn to art and politics, surprisingly enough, and possibly even philosophy. Okay, so this might be the last thing you would think I would present as a source of inspiration, and I'll explain why I am. This is Rodin's Caryatid, Fallen Under Her Stone. This is a young woman being crushed by a boulder. Um, so how could this possibly be remotely inspiring? Well, uh, the best single piece of art criticism I have ever seen is uh, by science fiction writers Robert Heinlein's um, analysis of this sculpture that he included as part of his novel, Stranger in a Strange Land. That piece of art criticism is practically a poem in its own right. So I'm going to read that. Uh, she's a good girl. Look at her face. Serious, unhappy at her failure, not blaming anyone, not even the gods. And still trying to shoulder her load after she's crumpled under it. She's a symbol for every woman who ever shouldered a load too heavy, but not alone women. This symbol means every man and woman who ever sweated out life in uncomplaining fortitude until they crumpled under their loads. It's courage and victory. Victory in defeat, there is none higher. She didn't give up. She is still trying to lift that stone after it has crushed her. She's a father working while cancer eats away his insides to bring home one more paycheck. She's a 12-year-old trying to mother her brothers and sisters because mama had to go to heaven. She's all the unsung heroes who couldn't make it but never quit. So what does this have to do with scientific integrity? Well. A number of things, I think. The pushback against the science reformers has been fierce. The older generation of successful scientists, you can think Ivy League named chairs, has not sat around passively allowing the prestige and influence and power to uh, go, uh, uh, to be challenged by grassroots scientists at lesser institutions. Reformers have been called publicly in print and in social media, this, these are quotes, shameless bullies, vigilantes, self-appointed data police, vicious methodological terrorists, and have been accused of engaging in ad hominem attacks that destroy lives. Senior scientists routinely accuse the reform movement of harming the careers of their friends, students, and cronies by publicly airing their errors. But as uh, Columbia statistician Andrew Gelman, who is part of the, I've described as part of the science reform effort, uh, uh, put it, un first, he really made two points. First, uncovering flawed work is part of scientific self-correction. Like, self-correction is one of the things the sciences claim make it superior to other ways of understanding the world. Scientists, as opposed to, for example, religion, self-corrects. But the only way you self-correct, saying, well, no, this was wrong. Here's why we know it was wrong. Here is what's right. And here is now the belief or the claim that needs to change. It's the only way that that's going to happen. And then he makes a second point. For every person harmed by exposés of their errors, there may well be three or five, or 50 young researchers who were doing slow, careful work and who did not get picked for a great job because they could not compete with those who did lots of sloppy but flashy work that got them TED Talks and New York Times coverage. So the caryatid, to me, is a symbol of all those 
fallen scientists, because many of them, in my view, are the best hope of saving science from itself. Which gets me to this, Islands of Honesty. So this is a New York Times article. It's actually a political article. It has nothing to do with science. There have been a rash of in, sort of impeachments and indictments of major national leaders around the world over the last year or so. So uh, this, uh, the, uh, South Korea and Brazil and Guatemala and so forth. And this article is like, what the hell is going on? It also makes two points. First, that you get these, in some countries, cultures, these systems of corruption. Sometimes a social or cultural system becomes so riddled with corruption that even fundamentally honest people have little choice but to act in corrupt ways in order to get by in that system. These sort of corrupt systems take on a life of their own and they're very hard to change. But sometimes they do change. And this is the perspective in this article. Uh, you know, this is an article. It's not scientific evidence. I like this article, though. They argue that what can disrupt these sort of systems of corruption are islands of honesty. Sometimes in these systems you have prosecutors, even other politicians, who refuse to be corrupted and who take to task some of the others who are themselves corrupt. Now, sometimes these islands of honesty are themselves crushed by the powers that be. There's no guarantee, there's far from no guarantee here. But sometimes they inspire other islands of honesty and even popular uprisings against corruption. And at some point, if there is enough of an outcry and enough of these islands of honesty, you get a tipping point that can flip a corrupt system back to a mostly non-corrupt system. So what does this have to do with um, scientific integrity? Well, I, this is what I think it has to do with scientific integrity. It means that each of us, each of you, whether you're a scientist or not, because I think these issues go way beyond science, no matter how small or uninfluential we or you may feel or be, no matter how ignored you think you are, you can actually make a difference. There's no guarantee. I am not promising that you will be able to make a difference. You may be crushed. That's also possible. And even if you're successful, it may not be obvious for a very long time that you have changed anybody else's behavior. But each additional island of scientific integrity, and I'm focusing mainly on the science, has some chance. I, you know, how much of a chance? I don't know. I can't tell. I felt like for most of my career, I was working alone in a dark, locked room, you know, where nobody around for 100 miles to listen. So you don't know, but you have some chance to contribute to a tipping point that'll bring science back from the precipice. OK, so I think I would end with a couple of these thoughts I, that, you know, at best, science is operating incredibly inefficiently. Inefficiently means, you know, OK, maybe it's not completely dysfunctional, but there's enough dysfunction that a lot of time, effort, and money is being spent on really kind of useless stuff. At worst, we are promoting a large variety of inaccurate conclusions and possibly even causing harm by insp uh, inspiring the dissemination or creation of ineffective um, and, and um, counterproductive programs. So what do we do? The fundamental thing that we should do is act like scientists. So I've given all these sort of possibilities and about what are the causes of the dysfunctions and what are possible solutions. I don't, I'm not sure that any of them are actually true, but if you're a scientist, you don't just like, right? I mean, really, the, the issue here is, do we want an eminence-based science or an evidence-based science? So if we want an eminent, well, then we can just ask, you know, Ivy League name chairs tell us what to do, and then that's what we do, because they're eminent, and that's what we should do. 
Well, we should just follow them because they're famous. Or we could have an evidence-based science where we actually empirically investigate which of these proposed sources of dysfunction really are causing the dysfunction and which of these proposed solutions really do something to improve the quality of science. If we're scientists, we will empirically, we will treat those as empirical questions and seek to get evidence. And my second point is that right, the scientific dysfunction is a social and behavioral problem. Right? If you want to figure out how to solve social and behavioral problems, not that social and behavioral sciences don't have their own issues, I think I've been quite transparent about the problems that pervade social and behavioral sciences, but we are, in fact, if we do our jobs well, we are particularly well suited for figuring out the nature of social and behavioral problems. I mean, scientists behaving badly is a social behavioral problem. So, you know, I, I think this is a very, this is an inflection point. We, as scientists, have to choose between two worlds. One in which we realize science is malfunctioning and we hide the problems. Now, you might think, who would possibly, you know, we're scientists, we're academics, we can't hide. No, you, the discussions go something like this. We can't be airing this dirty laundry in public. This is something for us to discuss among ourselves. Just, you know, just think if Trump or the Republicans hear about these political biases and social, they're, they're going to use this as rhetorical fodder to undercut the funding for the social and behavioral sciences. We can't go public with any of this. So that is one view that is out there. Or, I would argue, we can act like scientists. And in my view, scientists can't be in the business of hiding things that are actually true. That's kind of like the core nature of what science is, is finding out things that are actually true. And the second we go down the path of hiding things that are actually true, we're just as bad as politicians. Which means that in this second point, this inflection point, we, rec we acknowledge the problems, we embrace trying to solve them, and we set to do so effectively and transparently. To me, the solution to bad science is science. Thank you. We now have time for several questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and Sarah or I will come to you. Uh, so I thought that was a very interesting presentation. Thanks for uh, coming out here. I'm gonna push back though against a specific point you made uh, roughly a third through the presentation. I don't have the slide number, unfortunately. I can track it down. Uh, but you talked about how when results come in that surprise us, we're more likely to investigate them uh, more thoroughly. And when results confirm a hypothesis, we're less likely to investigate them thoroughly as if this was necessarily a bad thing. But you can imagine a sort of uh, a Bayesian uh, defense of doing that, right? Where you, where you admit that, well, these two results are not equally probable. One of them is more probable than the other. And so when, when the result that is less probable shows up, you're naturally more skeptical. So I agree when taken to an extreme, it's, it's not ideal, but there can be situations where that might in fact be the way to proceed. And okay. that's the way we work in everyday life often. Yes. So. So, firstly, you perfectly described the psychology of it. I mean, that's absolutely the psychology of it. Um, I, I would um, push back on the pushback only in the following way. Like, I, I, everything you said is true. I would simply argue that when you're in the business of scientific research, you should be engaging in careful proofing, no matter how the results come out. In fact, you should probably be engaging in careful pr proofing before you have the results. That's it. Hi, uh, thanks for that talk, it was very interesting. Um, so 
the the title of your talk uh, starts uh, science going bad. Um, and I'm wondering, is this a new phenomenon, do you think? Or is it just a, an old phenomenon that we're only starting to realize? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So it's probably a little bit of both, but that's just a guess. Um, there are certainly um, historical examples of problematic scientific practices that go back centuries. Uh, so to some extent, you know, and, so, and some of these, to the extent that th there, there are always incentives for things other than the truth, you know, in the uh, Middle Ages and the Renaissance, it would be to please your aristocratic benefactor, right? So um, uh, probably there is some degree to which this has, these issues have always been there. However, especially since first, you know, again, the roots of this go back decades. People have been sounding these alarms for a very long time. But it was really John Ioannidis' e efforts in biomed, you know, the why most published findings are false, that began to create this upsurge in attention to these issues. And then there was the crisis in psychology that really kind of solidified this as a set of issues. So probably there is now more attention being paid to them. And as, you know, as more attention is being paid, more and more problems are being discovered. Yeah. So I mean, I, I mean my, what works for me is a metaphor of you're kind of walking around a rug, the rug looks nice. You know, you see a little kind of spot on the rug, so you pick it up and there's a roach nest. Right? So then you kind of clean that up and then you kind of say, well, you know, is, is that all of them? So you pick it up again and there's another roach nest. So we haven't picked up the whole rug yet. But certainly, if we, before we weren't looking for roaches, it just looked like an intact rug. Thank you for a thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, in one of the first uh, 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 transparency that you showed uh, was th this one. Uh, you have uh, actually made a, a co final comment that indeed those are not proof of science, but technology. Haven't you uh, thrown, in this case, the baby with the dirty water uh, in search of a solution for your problem? Uh, well, I don't want to be throwing anything, you know. Um, uh, uh, you know, really what I hope is to sort of reinvigorate the sort of equality in sciences. Um, I do think, you know, in the fir first place, you know, we went to the moon, that was an amazing thing. Kind of haven't been back in a really, really long time. Like, in a really long time, I don't know, you know. Uh, is that a good thing? Uh, maybe necessary thing? You know, the Mars landing thing, that was pretty cool, right? The flyby of Jupiter and Saturn, that's pretty cool. Uh, so there was, you know, I, if, if you hear me as saying, you know, science is completely useless and not doing anything useful, that would be, I'm not saying that. Um, technology is a little... Oh yeah, I don't know. Listen, e engineering and technological accomplishments are great, but there. So, th so I'm kind of torn there, right? Because there's academic engineering, which, as far as I can tell, is as seriously plagued by these problems as anything else. And these are sort of corporate products, right? And so, if the corporation makes a computer that doesn't work, they're, going, they're not going to last very long. So, engineering absolutely does have certain advantages that, uh, with respect to sort of being constrained by reality in a way that may be less true of not only the social and behavioral sciences, but also the biomedical sciences. So yes, I mean, it, the, you know, with engineering, the thing either works or it doesn't, and you can figure that out really pretty quickly. Yes, I, absolutely, that's completely true. Do, am I selecting who? Thanks for coming. So my question involves political biases impeding the advancement of science, um, especially after this week when politics seems like such a high stakes game. How well positioned do you think that the social sciences are to bridge this political chasm and maybe what are the other actors, political and otherwise, that need us to bring about this kind of scientific revolution that you uh, argue for? Um. 
uh, I guess I will say two things on that. I am uh, deeply concerned about the seeming disregard, repeated disregard for truth of the current administration. Truth, science, kind of kindred. So I think that's a pretty serious problem. Um, at the same time, I also think this is one of the strengths of Heterodox Academy. It's one of the reasons I'm a member and founding member is that one of the purposes of Heterodox Academy is to get people from across partisan divides to, to talk to each other. They don't have to agree with each other, but they have to listen to each other. They don't have to, but we want to encourage them listening to each other. And I, I, will, will that help science? I, don't, I would guess that it would, actually. I, I, I would guess that it would. That, that for um, people on the right who would be concerned about the problem of political biases in academia, and especially the social sciences, to see that the social sciences are actually acknowledging that and attempting to grapple with that has some chance uh, you know, again, it's an empirical question. I can be completely tilting at windmills here. It can be completely useless. I don't know. I don't have data on this. But there's some chance that that would actually improve and therefore ultimately make more willing to listen to some of the stuff among people on the right. People on the left, I think, often have a sneering, dismissive disregard for what they believe people on the right think. But if you actually listen to people on the right think, they often don't think what people on the left think they think. So, I'm not confident in any of those answers, though. So, best I can do. Unfortunately, that's all the time we'll have for questions. Please join me in thanking Dr. Justin. <laughs>